Hello again. A while ago I reviewed the Elk SD64, which is a little cartridge that fits in the back of the Acorn Electron to offer an SD card interface, 16K extra of sideways RAM, and some useful utilities. But what if you've got a plus one interface on the back of your Electron? That fits into the same cartridge slot as the Elk SD64, but doesn't offer a throughput port. Well, the same guy who makes the Elk SD64 also makes the Elk SD plus one. This fits into one of the cartridge slots on the top of the plus one to offer an SD card interface very similar to the SD64. So, should you ditch your Elk SD64 and replace it with an Elk SD Plus One and a Plus One interface? Well, that's what we're going to find out today, and the short answer, without spoiling anything, is yes and no, which is why we're also going to have a look at the Advanced Tube interface, which is another product that can help tip the balance in favour of replacing it with the Plus One. So, by much request, here is my review of the Elk SD Plus One. Okay, so let's start by installing the Plus One on the Electron. So first you have to remove the Elk SD64, or any other add-on using the rear edge connector. Then you fit the plus one onto the same connector, and secure it with the two big chunky screws. After we're done, we have a large box that sticks out the back, with two cartridge slots on top similar to those on a BBC Master. Now you might think that the Elk SD64 could fit into one of these slots, but they're not the same as the connector on the back of the Electron. Indeed, they're the other way round, giving a slot rather than a card edge. So this is where the Elk SD Plus One comes in. It has a very professional looking printed label on the front, a full size SD card slot on the top, and most importantly, a card edge connector on the bottom which fits into either cartridge slot. Once you add the Elk SD Plus One, you can turn on your Electron and you'll get an extra line telling you the MMFS sideways RAM filing system is loaded, very similar to the Elk SD64. The only obvious difference is that it uses the SPI interface, which is much quicker than the Electron printer port interface on the Elk SD64. One thing that is missing, however, is the RH Plus One support ROM, and we'll come on to that in a bit. The SD card interface works exactly the same as it does on the Elk SD64, and you can slot in a card with a beep.mmb file on it, giving a library of 512 virtual DFS floppy disks. I won't cover that anymore here, but you can watch my earlier video if you want a quick tour. Okay, so uh, while the cartridge slots on the Plus One expansion unit allow you to connect all sorts of strange things like second processors and disk controllers, in terms of sideways memory they only allow you to access two banks. The rear one banks numbers 0 and 1 and the front one's bank numbers 2 and 3. Now because I've got the Elk SD Plus One in the front slot, that means it can only access banks 2 and 3, which means it can't provide the four slots of sideways memory that the Elk SD64 does. Before we look at the Elk SD Plus One's memory, I think it's worth recapping how the Elk SD64 works. The Electron has a 16-bit memory space, giving a total of 64K of directly accessible memory. The RAM occupies the bottom half of the memory space and provides space for the screen, programs and workspace, and the Acorn MOS ROM sits in the top 16K. The sideways or page memory area sits between 32K and 48K in the memory map. On the unexpanded system, this always contains BASIC, sitting in bank 11, hex B. Aside from the SD card interface, the Elk SD64 adds four banks of sideways memory, two banks of RAM, numbers 12 and 13, hex C and D, and two banks of flash, 14 and 15, hex E and F, which is effectively ROM. The top bank, F, comes with the Retro Hardware Plus One Utilities ROM by default. It can be replaced by another of your choice using Utility, but the extra commands added by this ROM are useful to manage the sideways RAM banks. The next bank, E, contains the MMFS SD card filing system code in ROM. This is a special version that copies itself into RAM bank D on startup, as it uses the spare bit of RAM in the top of that bank to avoid using main memory for workspace, and keep the start of usable memory, known as page in BASIC, at hex E00, the same as it would be on a tape-only system, for maximum compatibility. The spare RAM bank, C, is blank on power-up, and you can load software into this, such as extra programming languages or other applications. OK, so how does the Elk SD Plus One version differ? Well, as each slot only provides access to two banks of sideways memory, the Elk SD Plus One provides one bank of RAM and one bank of hybrid ROM and RAM. The lower bank, two in my case, as I've got it inserted into the front slot of the Plus One, contains the same sideways RAM version of MMFS as the Elk SD64, albeit a slightly newer build, but stored in flash rather than RAM. This is the ready-to-run version and not the bootstrap one that requires copying to RAM first. Some special memory control logic overlays a small block of RAM at the top required for the filing system workspace. 
The upper bank, 3 in my case, is a full 16k of regular sideways RAM and lost on power down. So, the Elk SD Plus 1 effectively gives you the same thing as bank C and D on the Elk SD64, without the need to have that special MMFS bootstrap ROM. You have, however, lost the utilities ROM, so you haven't got all those handy extra commands for managing the sideways RAM, but that's where the next bit comes in. So, the Plus 1 just looks like a box with some connectors on it, but inside there's actually a socketed ROM that is mapped to sideways bank C. From the factory, the Plus 1 comes with a small 4K support ROM, which just contains some code to drive the extra printer and joystick ports, and will show up with star help, but otherwise not really show anything useful. You can, however, replace this ROM with something else, and this is where the Retro Hardware Plus 1 Utilities ROM comes in. That replaces the insipid one that comes with the Plus 1 for something with a little more capability. The Elk SD Plus 1 itself doesn't come with a replacement ROM, but you can download and burn an EEPROM yourself, or find someone else willing to do it for you. You'll need the 8K version of it though, as the socket in the Plus 1 doesn't support the full 16K of a sideways bank. So, with the ROM replaced and the Elk SD Plus 1 installed, you have all the utilities of the Elk SD64, with the exception of the tree copy utility, as that needs the extra space in the 16K version. This lets you load programs into sideways RAM from the SD card, as well as lots of other handy things, like set the language to start on break, and dump the contents of files in hex and ASCII. Right, so now you're back to an Elk SD64, but you've got this great big box sticking out the back of your Electron. I mean, sure, you've gained a joystick connector and a printer port, but maybe they're not so useful. But there is this spare cartridge connector at the back. Maybe we can shove something in there. Enter the Retro Hardware Advanced Tube Interface with ABR Technology. That's Advanced Battery Back RAM to you. This is a recent development that combines a tube second processor interface at the top here, along with an updated version of the 1987 Prez ABR cartridge, with two banks of 16K sideways RAM backed up by a coin cell battery. Right, so ignoring the tube bit for a moment, all I have to do is uh, pop this in the rear slot on the uh, plus one and switch on, and I've got two banks of sideways RAM, in my case banks number zero and one because I've put it in the rear slot. So, after powering on, we now get told we have 80k of RAM, 32 in the Electron, 16 in the Elk SD Plus One, and 32 more in the ABR. And suddenly a lot of those mysterious extra commands in the Plus One Utilities ROM start to make sense. For example, you can use star lock and star unlock commands to protect and unprotect each bank, preventing them from being accidentally overridden. The inverted R in the star ROMs output shows if a bank is RAM and writable. You can then load in a ROM image from the SD card, such as a new programming language. And it even stays there after powering off and on again. You also get an EEPROM of the utilities ROM, included with the ABR, to put in the plus one, so you don't have to sort that out for yourself. And finally, also included is this handy printed manual, which explains all the extra commands and how to control the ABR from machine language. So, just to recap, with the Elk SD Plus One, we got a 16K bank of sideways RAM and MMFS. We've also swapped the ROM in the Plus One to get the extra utilities, and we've added the ABR cartridge to get two more banks of 16K sideways RAM with battery backup. Right, so now we've overtaken the Elk SD64, because not only have we got an SD card interface and the utilities ROM inside the Plus One, we've now got three banks of sideways memory, two of which can be unlocked and locked from software, which gives us the best of ROM and RAM, and we haven't even looked at this tube interface yet. The tube is one of the most interesting bits about the Acorn 8-bit series, starting on the BBC Micro, but also being available on the Electron. It lets you attach a second processor, known as the Parasite processor. This does all the main computation, leaving the original one in the Electron to just manage the I.O., screen, keyboard, storage, etc., and it then becomes known as the I.O., or host processor. Okay, now the uh, tube warrants a whole pile of videos in itself, but today I'm just going to give you a quick demo of the PyTube Direct, which is the easiest, cheapest, and simplest way to get started with a tube processor these days. The PyTube Direct is a piece of modern open source software and hardware to attach a Raspberry Pi to the tube interface and have it emulate a pile of contemporary processors, including a 6502, Z80, 80286, and even the ARM2. There are various people selling these boards new online. You can buy just the board and add your own Pi and SD card, or you can get a ready to run kit with a board, Pi, card, and cable. The boards without a cable are often designed to connect directly into the connector underneath a BBC Micro and fit in the cavity under there with a Pi Zero on them. 
So for an electron, you probably want one with a ribbon cable, given where the connector is on the ATI cartridge. Here I've got the RetroClinic Pi 3A Plus kit. All I did was add this plastic box to make it easier to move about. Once connected, the tube processor starts automatically, although because the electron boots more quickly than the Pi, it needs an extra control break afterwards to give it time to start. The only support a tube processor needs from the electron is the tube host code, which is included in the replacement plus one ROM. From then on, everything runs as normal. The system defaults to a 6502 running at the maximum speed the Pi can emulate, which on my Pi 3A Plus is roughly a 350 MHz one, which speeds up the trig calculations quite a bit. To give it a bit of a workout, I wrote this Mandelbrot set generator in BASIC. It renders the image into a buffer on the tube processor and uses a fast data transfer over to the host processor's screen memory, taking just under a minute and a half to render this image. I can switch between processors with the star tube command, so let's change to the native 1.4 GHz arm. And in terms of basic performance, it's now more like a 10 to 20 GHz 6502. And my Mandelbot program now completes in just over a second. Finally, you can disable the tube processor with star tube off to go back to the internal 2 MHz 6502 in the Electron if you want to run something that hits the hardware directly, like a game, or for more sedate trigonometry. So, a couple of things before we wrap up. Firstly, the LSD Plus One claims to be faster. Let's try that. I've written a little program to save a 16K file 10 times and time it, and then load it 10 times and time that. On the LSD Plus One without the tube processor, it takes 8 seconds to save 160 kilobytes of data, and just under 7 to load it. Turning the tube processor on, it takes a similar time to save it, but just over double to load it. There's the extra work of transferring the data across the tube interface each time, but I'm not sure why the loading is so much slower, but this is consistent. We can force the load to write to the host processor memory, avoiding the need to transfer it over the tube after reading it, and the speed is much the same as without the tube. Finally, switching back over to the ELK SD64 and repeating the same test, the speeds are about 22 seconds to save and 30 seconds to load, so that's somewhere around 3 to 4 times slower. So the claims are certainly true, although since the Electron only has 32 kilobytes of memory, I don't think you're going to be waiting around long in either case. OK, and finally there's a new product, the ELK SD128. This is a beefed up version of the 64 with extra RAM. I don't have one of these, but from what I can get from the instructions for it, it has 8 banks of 16k sideways RAM, 0-7. It also has the plus 1 utilities ROM in bank F, and the MMFS ROM in bank E. This is the version that copies itself to RAM bank 7 on power-up, similar to what happens on the ELK SD64. The instructions also state that bank C is ROM, but I can't work out what's in there. The ELK SD128 has a joystick port, but the code for that is stated to be in bank F with the utilities ROM. In addition, the SD card interface is the same faster SPI version that's on the ELK SD Plus One. It does, however, retract a price premium over the 64, being about £65 instead of £40 as I'm recording this. So there you are, there's your three options. So which one should you get? Well, I think the straightforward choice for most people is the uh, SD64. That lets you play a bit of Chucky Egg, do a little bit of programming, it's cheap, it's easy to install, and you don't need any extra hardware except an SD card. For people who want to do a bit more programming, load a few utilities and language ROMs in, probably the 128 is a better choice. It has a joystick port, I don't feel many Electron games really need a joystick, but you don't lose anything over the 64, so except £25. The plus one option gives you a lot more flexibility to install things like tube processors, you can even replace one of the cartridges with a disk interface to run a real physical disk drive or maybe a GoTech. But you do have to have a plus one, which costs extra money, you end up with this great big box sticking out the back. And the ATI ABR cartridge isn't available right now, so that's a bit of a probably a niche choice. Um, but whichever one you pick, they're all good. Um, so I hope you found that interesting, maybe even useful. Um, so thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.